This may come as a surprise to some of you, but Five Nights at Freddy's used to actually be scary. <laughs> While those days have long passed, there are still people out there producing really scary FNAF and non-FNAF content. I wanted to go over what I believe to be some of the creepiest content currently circulating through YouTube. Discretion is advised. Jacob? It's time to go home, baby bird. This terrifying scene is the opening of Baddington's reimagining of Squimpus McGimpus's sound response check. Here we witness what is presumably one of the original victims from the incidents of the first game being captured by Chica. The scene starts with a girl in the pizzeria restroom who has presumably just finished washing her hands. Holding a camcorder, she is startled by a noise to her right and turns. Chica is peeking into the room. The girl calls out to Chica, mostly in curiosity, but with a hint of fear in her voice. Chica? The scene then cuts to the girl hiding in one of the bathroom stalls. Chica is stalking her through the restroom, mechanical stomps reverberating throughout the room. One of the things I find creepiest about this clip is how robotic Chica's animation and actions are. She only speaks in what appear to be canned dialogue lines. It's time to go home, baby bird. All of her movements are deliberate. They all have purpose, like a robot's movements ought to. When the girl desperately calls out, Mommy? Chica responds in a very believably robotic way. Her head turns forward almost like she's just switched from search mode to locate source of sound mode. After a moment processing the noise, Chica's head snaps around, staring directly at the source of the sound, which also happens to be the camera and our protagonist. Baddington's attention to detail is incredible, and it becomes especially apparent when we compare Chica in sound response check to the animatronics in Security Breach. Obviously, a big game can't achieve the same level of visual fidelity as a 40-second animated scene. Nobody disputes that. Still, I can't help but feel that the Glamrock animatronics near lifelike fluidity and complex speech capabilities make them feel more like people than they do robots. For me, that makes the scenario less scary. It helps that the scene is so realistic. I had to squint for a bit when I first saw it, unsure as to whether Baddington composited animations over actual film or if it was all just animated. Sure enough, I think it's all animated. The only real giveaways are the edges of walls and some shadows, which, upon scrutiny, look a little too perfect. That said, Baddington hides this really well through their use of filters that mimic analog degradation. When combined with the period accurate 4x3 resolution, the grainy audio, and the constant drone in the background, this visual distortion really sells the idea that what we're witnessing is actual found footage. This further adds to the scene's realism and ultimately the terror. It would be really cool if you clicked subscribe. Only if you want to though. For all these reasons and more, I believe this clip more than any other encapsulates what makes the core premise of Five Nights at Freddy's so strong and how it can still be scary, even in 2022. Yes, there is a jump scare, and while it certainly fits into the video, I find the clip much creepier without it. Without the jump scare, we never get the release of tension that leaves one feeling far more unnerved. That said, there's the whole second part of the video, and the jump scare serves as a very necessary tension release after such an intense intro. Security Breach leans heavily into the series lore. In many ways, the Mega Pizzaplex is a house built of Easter eggs. Many argue that it was FNAF's lore that popularized it in the first place, but I would argue otherwise. Oh, I love you! I believe the lore was only so interesting to us in the first place because the spooky premise and scenario in the first game was so strong. I feel like Baddington's scene proves that none of that complexity is necessarily required to make FNAF great. I've shown sound response check to many friends who have zero knowledge of FNAF and they still find it quite unnerving. Being in an enclosed room with only a single exit and a physically imposing figure that you cannot overpower standing between you and it, that's a scary scenario for anyone to imagine. It helps Baddington scene stand on its own even without dictionaries of lore behind it. That's not to say the video doesn't align itself with the existing FNAF canon. It absolutely does. Sound response check, as well as most of Baddington's FNAF content, focuses primarily on retelling what I feel is one of the most interesting aspects of the FNAF story and one that is ironically completely neglected in the game, the details of Afton's crimes. 
Throughout Baddington series, we witness the five victims lured into the back of Freddy's. We see firsthand, and often in first person due to the use of found footage, just how horrifying the scenario they're placed in. When FNAF 1 first came out, this was the kind of stuff that the game left up to our imaginations, and it made the concept all the scarier. Those of us old enough to have actually been to a Chuck E. Cheese were able to imagine being there, alone, stalked by a giant creepy robotic rat, and it spooked us. That premise is so strong, and it resonated so well with people. The entire FNAF series has essentially rode its coattails for the last eight years or whatever. Honestly, I never thought that anyone could adapt those scenes in such a way that they'd be scarier than what I had imagined. Adaptations almost always tend to be underwhelming when we've built up these events in our heads for so long. Imagine my surprise when I found that Baddington not only met the expectations I had for these horrifying scenes, but exceeded them in every way imaginable. The content is scary, really, really unsettling. It's essentially a how-to guide for effective analog horror. There was a whole recent debacle with the latest upload in the series, Pirate Cove Pre-Show, which was taken down by YouTube for being too scary or something dumb like that. Fortunately, it's available again, and I highly encourage you to check it out if you've enjoyed what you've seen so far. Link is, of course, in the description. This video leans heavily on some composited renders that are quite spooky to look at. It features Afton, who actually comes off as menacing instead of the bumbling idiot we know from the games. Instead of emphasizing the mad genius part of his personality, we see the much more twisted and concerning side of Afton, the one who lures and stuffs victims into robotic suits. I know that some people find distorted faces goofy. I admit it's become a bit of a played out trope recently. Between the Walton Files, the Mandela Catalog, Local 58, it does kind of feel like every analog horror our series is doing it. However, I do think Baddington is quite good at it, and the distorted faces we see in their content are pretty creepy looking. They're also used rather sparsely, which enables them to retain their shock value for as long as possible. Baddington's non-FNAF content is excellent for all of the same reasons, so if you enjoy really spooky FNAF and FNAF-esque content, I highly encourage you to check their channel out. Just be aware of any content advisories and don't watch anything that you think may upset you. I think the analog horror genre as a whole has enabled individual to depict surreal, impossible locations and scenarios in a realistic yet affordable way. While it isn't FNAF content, Kane Pixel's recent Backrooms found footage tape is a great example of this. The use of found footage, analog distortion, low resolution, and tiny camcorder audio allows creators to sell visuals that just wouldn't look realistic in higher fidelity. The entire settings for the Backrooms video is impossible. You would need to build a massive set to film something like that, and that would be ridiculously expensive. Animating it in high definition would make it look a lot less realistic without a huge team of professional animators. The whole analog horror genre, which I absolutely consider FNAF to be a part of, has enabled creators to depict plausible but unrealistic scenarios in a really convincing way. The shot design is also super important. Note how in both Baddington's clip as well as the Backrooms video, we don't ever get a super clear look at the antagonist. In Baddington's clip, we first see Chica leering in the entryway, cloaked in shadow. The next scene is viewed through the slit in the stall door, which obstructs our view of Chica. In the final scene, Chica is standing behind a door for most of it, and even when we do see her, the protagonist's perspective means that Chica is being lit from the fluorescent lights behind her. By using the monsters sparingly, they stay spookier for longer. By preventing us from getting a great look at them, it's harder for us to spot imperfections that break the illusion. The Backrooms monster operates in a similar way. The protagonist is fleeing from them and only steals a glance at the creature every now and again. This makes attempts to freeze frame on the entire monster pretty futile. It just appears as a blurry mess due to the motion of the camcorder. While this technique allows for scarier content at lower budgets, Baddington and Kane Pixels are particularly masterful at effectively implementing analog horror into animation. Sure, we don't ever get a great look at the monsters in these clips, but it works because the shots all make sense in the context of the film. The girl is hiding from Chica in a bathroom. It makes sense that the shots are through a gap in the bathroom stall. The protagonist of Kane Pixel's backrooms footage is fleeing for their life. Of course they aren't focused on getting a great look at whatever the heck is chasing them. This meticulous shot planning makes it less obvious that these techniques are being used. Found footage videos often take place from a first person perspective. If the person holding the camcorder is acting in a natural way that makes sense for the situation they're in, it becomes a lot harder to notice that more complex fantasy or science fiction elements are being deliberately obstructed. Up until this point, most analog horror series had to be really sparing with their animation, as their budgets are low, and allowing composited images to remain on screen for too long makes them look a lot more obviously unrealistic. 
I really enjoy series like the Monument Mythos and the Mandela Catalog, but I don't think anyone would say their visuals are particularly realistic. It's really difficult and expensive to do that. This is why we see the Atari-style minigames in the FNAF series, and it's why series like the Walton Files, Petscop, and even Andy's Apple Farm, which itself is just straight up playable, rely on retro game aesthetics as a vehicle for storytelling. It's a really affordable way to create animated content that takes place within a video game. This keeps simple animation from breaking immersion with the story. This is why I think it's so exciting to see independent creators like Baddington and Kane Pixels absolutely crushing it with plausible, near-photorealistic videos. Sometimes, higher fidelity is worse. Security Breach is a much clearer, sharper game than its predecessors, and that takes away from some of the horror. We constantly get great looks at the animatronic models, and while they do look good, they become too familiar to be scary. The game somewhat amends this by having them wither throughout the course of the night, but the Mega Pizza Plex is still simply too bright, and the enemy counters are too frequent. The assets will never stay scary for long in a circumstance like that. The fluid movement of the animatronics also takes away some of their intrinsic terror, in my opinion. Compare Security Breach to Chica in Sound Response Check, or the monster in the Backrooms video, and you'll see the difference is night and day. Part of what makes animatronics so creepy is their uncanny robotic movements, and Security Breach kind of missed the mark on that one. Fortunately, we have creators like Baddington, Kane Pixels, Phil from FNAF Plus, and others putting a lot of effort into creating high fidelity, realistic, scary experiences. Even cooler, they're doing it independently and without huge budgets and without tons of support. I've seen a lot of mixed feelings about Security Breach. Some people like it a lot, others find it to be too great of a departure from the aesthetic of the earlier games. If, like myself, you find yourself in the latter group, I highly encourage you to check out the creators featured in this video. Links are as always in the description. And next time someone tries to argue that FNAF was always silly and it wasn't ever scary, show them the start of sound response check and see what they have to say. Thanks for watching. Baby no, Chica, you're scaring me. <laughs> Thank you.